Hi, I'm John Gatewood, founder and CEO of Gatewood Wealth Solutions, where we are on a mission to help individuals and families become and remain financially self-reliant. Welcome back to our weekly Market Insight broadcast, where we cover the week's top stories with regards to the market, the economy, and your portfolio, so you can make better decisions and be better informed about your money. And with us today is Aaron Tuttle, our Chief Investment Officer. Welcome back, Aaron, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it was, uh, I was glad to be out for the occasion last week, but I'm also glad to be back here with you guys. So Shelby is your new baby girl. Shelby Jean. So now you've got four members of the family. Yes. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. And, and uh, we're glad everybody was healthy. Yes. So a lot's been happening while, while you were gone. Has there? Well, we had a lot of noise coming from Washington, D.C. with regards to a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Let's start with that and see what's I, going on. I feel like that's just like 2.0, like we've been here before. They, we have it. talked about a lot of these before. but A lot of noise this, coming out of Washington as a way. Yeah, there, right? there is a lot of noise <laughs> coming out of Washington. Well, let's talk about this specific noise. Sure, so we can uh, jump our, uh, uh, right into it at the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill. Uh, it has passed the House had to go to the Senate. The Senate did remove the $15 minimum wage due to the parliamentarian rule where they could not include that. Uh, and now they have voted to approve $1.9 trillion. Many thought that that number would actually come down. Uh, it did not. It's now going back to the House to be approved. Uh, it's all likely it, it's, it's going to go through. We'll see it uh, by Friday. And President Biden will sign it into law. So we will have the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Are there any new implications of the law as we see it coming to pass? Uh, no really new things coming to pass. Uh, there were, like I said, a few things removed. Uh, so the $1,400 checks will be going out, uh, but they've lowered the phase out threshold. Uh, so at 80000 I think, uh, you, you get phased out. So there'll be uh, a little bit less money going out if you were in between. I think they had originally set it at like seventy five to $95,000. Uh, they've, they've lowered that, or maybe it was eighty five. I can't remember exactly. But that's really the, the big change there. And uh, the, uh, the one thing that was in question was that $15 minimum yeah. wage. So the next big package is going to be the infrastructure infrastructure spend. it's likely when will we start to hear about that and what will the market response be so think? the uh the current administration uh, anticipates having a uh a, the bill or a, a proposal out this month uh now after the 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus it seems that there's not as much uh, enthusiasm to get another three trillion dollar infrastructure spend uh, our belief is that it likely would go because both Republicans and Democrats do like to spend for infrastructure. Uh, and it, it seems that uh, the, the, the government is, is really wanting to open up the, uh, the wallet or I guess really uh, go to the Fed uh, to, to provide stimulus. Uh, John, uh, oddly, um, China is expected to grow by 6% uh, on its GDP in the U.S. the first time uh, since we've really been compiling this numbers is expected to exceed uh, the uh, Chinese growth in their economy that's and a lot of it has to do with the uh, the amount of stimulus that's being provided. Uh, now this th there's fears of inflation which we'll get in uh, and whether that's an actual real growth or not uh, is yet to be seen. One of the other things that we saw while you're out was the movement of interest rates on those uh, long dated treasuries. And know um, that, it, that there is certainly uh, a causation here, that the amount of money that the uh, federal government is creating and borrowing is driving up the, uh, the long end of the, uh, the curve. The, the Fed is still doing their asset purchasing. Uh, and there, uh, there's also the Treasury money that has been sitting there since the previous stimulus bill that'll be uh, uh, spent down. So that's a 12% right there on the money supply, but then this additional stimulus. And, and there are some concerns. Uh, if you take the 10-year and the five-year and subtract the two to get inflation ex expectations in the medium to long term, it's the highest it's been since that number's been tracked, which is not an old number. It's about 2005, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, we definitely are seeing inflation concerns priced into bonds here. And right. we're so seeing that in the on Interest on a relative basis, we see that inflation is higher than it's, that at least the expected inflation is higher than it's been for the last 15 years. Correct, correct. So what does that mean in terms of the bond prices and then the movement of the market? Because the market took a hit, and especially in terms of technology, we right. talked about it a little bit before. So it's, now I'm sure everyone is tired of us saying this, if interest rates <laughs> go up, 
bond prices go down, and if interest rates go down, bond prices go up. There's that seesaw effect, uh, the, uh, and we can see that uh, year to date. Uh, I took a snippet uh, just yesterday. The seven to ten year Treasury bonds are down four and a half percent. Now it's not easy to see, but in that lower uh, column, the S and P at the time is a positive four point eight seven percent. So if you're thinking bonds are, are the way that I need to uh, to preserve uh, and, and remove uh, the the downward movement. That's not working so far year to date, uh, and this is a more prolonged. It didn't just start at the beginning of the year. Uh, the rate started to increase in August, so if we were to go back, this number would be more negative, uh, and certainly the S&P would be more positive. And but it's the longer duration bonds were even hit harder. Yeah, so if you're in an ETF that trades the 20 year uh, and up maturity, you can see year to date 11.4%. That's, that's actually a technical correction. And I believe that for this, would, uh, they're in a bear market where they're down 20% from August. Uh, if I'm wrong on that, it's close. Uh, but uh, I don't remember if I checked that the precise number or not. But we're definitely close. Yeah, well, I know that it was uh, the Wall Street Journal reported this week that uh, it was in a um, technical correction. But uh, we shall see because there was a little bit of a rebound yesterday. Uh, yes, a little bit of a rebound. Um, and then if we look at just how much the bonds have sold, sold off, so this is just looking from previous highs and, and the correction and, and how deep it gets, this is the second worst bear market in 40 years. That's uh, amazing. It's only uh, uh, dwarfed by the, uh, uh, the taper tantrum. Uh, I think that was back in 2000, I think 13. Yeah, what uh, was that again, the taper tantrum? So uh, it was Operation Twist. Oh, where and, and they were going to taper their purchases uh, yes. and, and start to slow down quantitative easing and let it go away. Now, here we are again, still doing QE, uh, essentially just different names. Uh, but the, the last time that the, the Fed started to step away, we saw a taper tantrum. Uh, and that was without a lot of inflation expectations really showing up. So let's talk about inflation expectations and how we would measure that, because we've been talking about this for some time. Uh, so the, the next slide is, is for the market, but we can talk about oh, inflation. But it, that's right. So one of the things I said before is that, is that we had the, the equity prices all the same. Right, right. So We're especially technology, and those are those long duration securities that right. we talked about before. Absolutely. That the long duration meaning that the expected profitability is out farther in the future as right. opposed to right now from, let's say, a mature company that's already paying dividends or is not reinvesting in growth the way that a, a, that a, a growth company like a technology company Right. Would. And the last time we were together, we talked about how the market values and ultimately stocks and bonds are valued the same way. They value future cash flows. Uh, and if the interest rate that you're discounting those future cash flows increase, all things being equal, you'll see a drop in price uh, for stocks. Uh, so they're going to go the same way. Now, not all things are equal, and we talked about inflation uh, being a component that if inflation was actually greater than the increase in the risk-free rate, the way that the stock uh, uh, formula works, you don't necessarily see a drop in price. Uh, but not all stocks are created equal, like you were saying. Uh, so we would have the same movement here, but if we looked at future cash flows, and on the left we're just showing a company as if it was growing its, uh, it, its profit by 5% every year, year after year, what that cash flow would look like, and you would each discount that by the same factor. Uh, so it would be, let's say you were discounting it by 6%, on that 10th it would be 6 to the 10th power. And then the ninth would be uh, uh, discounted by ninth, uh, five to the ninth power. Uh, so not all stocks have this same uh, uh, pattern. Actually, very few stocks have that pattern. <laughs> right. uh, and um, you have these things known as growth stocks, which if you look at, and many people probably remember the PE multiples that Amazon used to trade at. Uh, they're still very high, uh, but they were at 1,000 PE. And that's because you were paying a price for the earnings that were so far out that they were actually negative at a lot of times. I remember whenever Amazon uh, 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 first made a, a, a dollar uh, in profit. <laughs> uh, Tesla recently passed that, if I remember right. Chris, yes. will, uh, who was here last week, will correct me if I, I have that wrong. He follows the stock more than I do. But the idea is that most of the earnings growth in a growth stock is way out in the future. So if you're discounting it and your interest rate changes, you're going to see a sell-off in those growth stocks more than you would be value. So uh, what you're saying is that the, the, on the chart on the left, it shows that um, the um, uh, earnings are being paid currently 
where the one on the right is, is the growth stocks where you, the right. expected earnings are going to be later. And they're usually very substantial. Uh, they still have a lot of the leverage on their balance sheet. Yes. But yes, yeah, so the, most of the value of this company would be near the front end uh, of this stock. Whenever you did the, the math and you're basically mm -hmm. adding up each future earnings uh, year, uh, where the growth stock, all of the earnings is further out, so if the discount changes, it's going to have an effect here. So that's so, why we call it a long duration, right. which is what you're going to refer to here. Uh, and keeping the, the inflation component that can offset this, if you were in a long duration or a short duration and interest rates did increase, the net present value of that stock would decline in both scenarios. But it's going to be felt a lot more in the long duration. You're going to see a big drop in long duration stocks, and you'll, be a, you'll see a much smaller uh, change in the short duration. Of course, on the other side is if you do have falling interest rates, you're going to see a big jump in growth stocks, and you're not going to see as big jump in value. And for our, our clients and, and those that are listening that uh, pay attention to the market, especially that old Fama French model where value will always outperform growth in the long term. That has not happened over the last 20 years, maybe even 30. Uh, and a lot of that has to do, we've been in a bull market for bonds, meaning that we've been in a falling interest rate. So the growth stocks have absolutely dominated in performance because of this effect. Now there's other reasons too, mm -hmm. but this was definitely some, uh, some tailwind for those growth stocks. Uh, and uh, now that that's reasserting itself, it may be time to have value in the portfolio. If you remember, we've talked about before, when I started in, in the business, long-term interest rates were 14, 15, 16% back in 1981. Right. I had a money market that was paying me 23%. Is that amazing? Yes. But even if you look at the average over that time period, it's, it's not close to that. But the question is, where are interest rates going to be going going forward? Because we've been, as you say, in a growth market. So value's really been out of favor because of the fact that we've had this long decline in interest rates. So that's going to make it tricky for a portfolio it, it management. Is, it is very tricky. How do we know which way to go? Uh, it, it is very difficult. Uh, we will be paying attention to the factors. How high can interest rates go? Well, uh, the Fed, they have not really started to do YCC, which is yield curve control. Uh, that's likely coming because, as you mentioned, 15%. We're at $30 trillion in debt. We cannot afford even, uh, to pay just the interest, we still have Social Security uh, mm -hmm. and Medicare. We have those legal obligations. They're not discretionary. They have to be spent, as is the interest. So at some point, if interest rates get too high uh, and the economy hasn't grown to a, way, uh, to a place where tax revenue is high enough to offset it, and remember, if you increase the tax uh, burden on the economy, oftentimes that can slow the growth. So it's not just as simple as raise the taxes. Right. So the, the, the current situation that the Federal Reserve uh, has found themselves is really they've painted themselves in a corner. There's not many tools they can do. So it's certainly going to be a tricky uh, environment. Uh, yes. But it, it is manageable, and we're here on mission to help our clients uh, become and remain financially uh, self-reliant. The remain part is really right. important. And it's going to be difficult because you can't go to bonds, as we talked about, with the, uh, the current uh, drop. That's not necessarily a place that's going to weather these storms uh, well. Uh, so the other thing is that inflation, uh, which is the ability to pass increased costs. So if we need to be shorter duration, considering a rising rate environment, you also want to be in companies, if we do have inflation, that can push that inflation out. Historically, you always uh, showed that cost uh, in a, a, a map like this, where energy or oil was the one, uh, the asset that was depicted that could push that inflation cost out. There's nothing really special about any uh, commodity or anything out there. It's really about supply and demand. Historically, we've been in an environment where oil uh, in, in your cars was needed. There was always going to de be a demand. So people would continue to purchase and they would actually not buy other things to make sure that they could continue to put oil in their car. With technology and with the idea of EV and solar panels, this may not always be true going forward. So we're, we want to do a deep dive to understand what is the actual demand and what is the structure people will use in their minds whenever they're budgeting out if we see inflation. What are the things that are going to continue to be bought, uh, especially if the price does increase? Coffee tends to be one of those. We've um, already seen the commodity prices going up, right? right? Lots in construction, lots in ju just different things that we're using every day. So are we seeing prices increase because of that? Where is it that they will typically see the increase? I use that oil and that type of thing for gas. Right. Are there things that we won't see it in? 
Uh, well, the idea is that technology has had a difficult time uh, pushing off inflation costs because technology, one, by itself is, is a deflationary effect, as you and Brian, right. or uh, you Chris. and Chris talked about last week. Uh, and we can see this in the, uh, the Radio Shack ad. I, uh, I've seen that ad you know, I think I may have that. You guys mentioned page. it. Like, I was like, that needs to come back. <laughs> uh, well, it's such a great explanation or just a visual. Right. I mean, so here, here's that computer that you were talking about. It's $1,600. Uh, and I'm sure this is at least 20 years old. And it has 20 uh, 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 megabytes right. hard drive. 20 megabytes. My, my phone is 256, 1,300 times. I don't think my phone would more even memory turn in my on phone. If that was all I had in memory. <laughs> the, where we where we keep our uh, um, our videos uh, here, yeah. we have an eight terabyte hard drive. That is just the amount of data that is relative to twenty. Well, think about it. You're doing a gig, uh, so a gig is a thousand uh, uh, meg. Uh, we're we're doing that just on the internet every, uh, what is it, nanosecond? I can't remember how, maybe it's a second for the internet. But it, it's, it's just remarkable. Remarkable. And then that's just one thing on this page. That, that phone over there does everything here and mm -hmm. more and doesn't cost as much as that computer. So that this, this is probably the area that we're unlikely to see a lot of the inflation costs being able to be pushed out on the, the consumer. It doesn't mean that demand can't all of a sudden jump uh, for technology and that becomes the top of the line on the budget. So the uh, question but, that becomes profitability in, those, in that sector right. versus profitability in, in the sectors where you know that that inflationary cost can be pushed out to the right. customers. Right. So how do we manage our portfolios given those factors? Well, we, we are uh, monitoring that. A lot of the changes we've, we've done has been moving away from our significant overweight from technology, which brought us just tremendous amount of value last year. Uh, we were up over 30% versus the benchmark because of our overweight to technology. Uh, it did get frothy, and now that we're starting to see the inflation and interest rates move up, those are the areas that are, are, are selling off while we're seeing that rotation. So uh, this area has been impacted more. We continue to watch it, uh, and I'll, there's a slide here that'll kind of give a, a little graphic here in a second on, on what we're doing, but we, we are shortening the equity duration just as we had shortened the duration in our bond portfolio, uh, and we're looking for things that can uh, weather inflation, but we do think this is transitory. We don't think this is going to be a long-term component because, as you and, and Chris talked about, a lot of that technology is probably going to be brought on to bring down costs. Uh, so there's a lot of robot, uh, automation, AI that can help offset it to probably dampen that back down again for a little while. Uh, so inflation risk, obviously, yes. we consider very high, though we understand and agree with the long-term deflationary argument, just with the amount of money that is being created in the system so quickly, we don't think that technology can offset it as quick, uh, quickly. We still favor equities over fixed income. Uh, as we're pointing out, the interest rate is hitting the bond market more uh, in a, a way that's causing the bonds to sell off, at least in the near term, more than equities. Uh, we do still favor U.S. domestic equity, as I, we started out. China is not expected to grow as fast as the U.S. over this next year. Uh, we do favor technology long term, but we are pulling back our exposure as we're seeing this rotation to value stocks at the what moment. What about emerging markets? Because don't they tend to do well when you have commodity prices going up? They do historically, uh, but there has been a lot of technology uh, companies that have grown substantially, especially in China. Take Alibaba, and that's become a bigger part of the emerging market index. So you want to be very specific about the companies and countries that you're investing in if you're trying to, uh, to do the commodities. They have developed uh, much further than they were 10, 15 years ago. It's, emerging markets is no longer just synonymous with commodities. Uh, they, they are developed economies uh, uh, relative to where they were before. Should, should we be in real estate? And I know that there's really two yeah. distinctions, right? Because you got the home builders and everything associated with that because the prices are rising, people are doing stuff for their home. Yet, the office and retail is being crushed by the fact that we've had this lockdown due to the it, coronavirus. It, yes. So how do we see that? It, it, it's not, it's not that? clear. Uh, as you said, the residential uh, real estate will do well. Ultimately, we think the commercial real estate will, will adapt and figure out uh, creative ways of, uh, of dealing with this, but they certainly have. The, the bull case is not as clear there. Uh, and so uh, we, we've been uh, a little bearish on real estate uh, and, as well as international. However, international, when you look at the indexes, are, are more value-oriented. 
So if we continue to see a value uh, orientation or reorientation or that rotation that the news is talking about, it may start to make international stocks look a little bit more attractive because they tend to be more value-oriented stocks. What's our view on the um, current valuation of the S&P 500 and where we see the targets resistance and so, so there, there's a lot of support uh, at a technical correction uh, I don't know that we'll see that especially with 1.9 trillion dollars of additional stimulus soon to hit the uh, uh, the economy um, th there's just a lot of money sloshing around that's the reason that we're seeing GameStop and Bitcoin and all these stocks do what they uh, they have been doing uh, it doesn't look like the Fed is going to slow so that stuff is going to continue on as long as there's a lot of money being pumped into uh, the system. Uh, that rotation, uh, because it's been so heavy technology for the last 10 years, they became a very large percentage of the S&P 500. Uh, so th there's a lot more exposure to growth uh, than there is value just because of the asset growth. Uh, so we've seen a little bit of a pullback through this rotation. Uh, if so you're on the S&P 500 now is still lagging, let's say, the global equity benchmark, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, I believe so. We'll see that page here in a minute. But I believe now you, have, you have an interesting slide that's coming up, and I was trying to understand that before. Right. Um, explain that to our audience. Uh, so this is, you take growth index over the value index. So if it's increasing as a number, so the, if growth is getting bigger, it, the line moves up. So that means growth is outperforming value. And then if value is outperforming, uh, I have that backwards, the other way. Uh, so value is, uh, uh, as growth is outperforming, it moves down. And as value is outperforming, it moves up. And then we can start to look at the trends of value uh, to growth to see kind of when should, is this a real rotation and when should we make changes? Uh, we have talked about our strategy. It's, it's really the, uh, whenever you're transitioning from one trend to another, and you're still in the old trend that worked, that's now going out of favor, and you haven't moved to the new trend, uh, you can get more of a sell-off and lose to your benchmark through that period until you start to get the signals. So this helps us try to hedge that bet. So if we look here, we've been in a long-term trend for growth outperforming value, and it got very low, but that very end, I don't know if you can, they can see it on their screen, but there's this big spike since uh, uh, really January. Right. Uh, and that is value reasserting itself, the reopening, uh, airlines, tourist industry, people driving, uh, all of the things that really got out of favor uh, during uh, the, the lockdowns are now reasserting themselves as it looks like the economy is recovering and, and going to open. And there's a lot of stimulus here to really propel this forward. So we're now no longer being dominated by growth and performance. Uh, now, if you look here, there's some trend lines, that blue line. That showed that before value was gaining on growth, and it was a head fake. So a lot of people were rotating the value just to see growth all of a sudden take off again. Uh, and that's what we don't want to happen. Uh, so in our portfolios, we're not going to value just because growth is out, out of favor. When we're in between these lines, we're looking at more core so that... So in other words, we'll be both growth and value right. so that we're, we're able to uh, benefit from whichever way that the right. market moves we're hedging. And that we're, trend. And we're looking for core uh, funds and, and stocks that are still doing better than the, the, the broad index. Uh, so they're, they're kind of, they're, they don't have that long or short duration component. They're in between, but w for whatever reason, they are doing better than the index. That's what we're trying to get. Now, what that means is if, if value does tr uh, outperform tremendously, we're not going to have the excess return that we did when we were heavy growth, when growth was dominating. Uh, it's going to be muted. Uh, but if we do have that reassertment of growth, like we saw yesterday, mm -hmm. the day before was classic uh, rotation. The index was negative, but pretty much flat negative. On the Dow Jones Industrial was up substantially. It's kind of more of a value uh, company, while the NASDAQ more growth was down substantially. So you really had that rotation where the center didn't move. And then yesterday, they just went back the other way. So this is an important thing to understand for our audience, because there will be times when you look at your statements, or you look online, you see your performance, and you may be lagging the benchmark for a specific period of time. We've fortunately built a nice cushion uh, mm -hmm. since uh, our, our portfolios did so well last year and even this year. But that's, the, that's just part of the equation when we're working in a momentum strategy. Right. But once that next trend takes hold, whether it's value or growth, 
we'll recapture that and then add some more excess return on the portfolios. Right. That's the goal. And though we favor technology and growth long term, we're really agnostic uh, uh, whenever it comes to these decisions. We want to move money to where the market is saying this is working. So uh, what worked in the, um, rel in the relative strength uh, indicator last week in terms of the different asset classes relative to each other? So it, we can go back and forth on uh, value versus growth. Uh, but what really was working, what was high, was small cap. And it was small cap value, but small cap core is right behind it. Uh, so there's no reason that you couldn't be at small cap because whether it's a long a duration or a short duration growth versus value uh, market, what we're fairly confident is is that the recovery is real and we have a long way to go. We're entering into a new bull market. And small cap, whether uh, value or growth, is probably going to do really well. Uh, and we're seeing that already. Uh, now the uh, does that mean uh, that we would overweight small cap? We we are overweighting small cap. Yes, uh, we're we're currently doing that, and we'll probably uh, see additions to uh, small cap uh, overweight as well. Now the the two areas that are negative or below the S and P 500 uh, is uh, the Nasdaq and the over-the-counter growth. So that's why we're making this rotation. It is a little painful uh, when you're in things that are now out of favor, especially after experiencing such a great year last year. Uh, it tends to be a, a sharp drop, but we are doing our best to mitigate that. Well, we wish we had that crystal ball that could tell us exactly the moment that we need to change. Well, it. It, it's not just the crystal ball. Uh, we would love to have it, um, but uh, maybe we could use some options. <laughs> but there is tax implications. Right, uh, that so, was one of the reasons that that uh, we were uh, hesitant to go and just make trades simply because the, we had so much in gains and not, not it hadn't gone to be long term in a lot of cases. So it's again, I think we talked about this last week with Chris that it's not what you earn, it's what you keep that matters. Right. So right. you do pay attention to that bottom line. So thanks again for your time today. Uh, it's been a very interesting time. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what happens with the um, the uh, stimulus bill and that subsequent uh, infrastructure, in, in infrastructure spend. And um, so I hope this has been helpful to you. As always, our, our goal is to give you better information about the economy, the market, so that you can make informed decisions about your portfolios and your money. And if you haven't subscribed already, we'd love to have you subscribe to our YouTube channel. How do they do that now? John, right below you in, the, in their YouTube view, you can see a subscribe button. Please hit subscribe so that you'll, you won't miss an update, uh, whether it's the Weekly Market Insight where we're taking a deep dive to give them actionable advice so they can make informed decisions or to get the skinny on the 3x3. Three three. The 3x3, three three, the skinny on Yeah, the skinny. As the three key relevant market movers in three minutes or less. And we, we hope to actually have uh, a casual Friday assessment where uh, Chris and, my, and myself and some of the investment committee will just have a nice conversation on, on things that are happening through the week. Uh, and then he, he's, he is actually thinking about doing some uh, technical analysis as a quick video uh, to just say, hey, here's how the market's moving and, and kind of explore some of these price points that we're talking about. That'd be great. Well, thanks again for joining in today and we look forward to having you back next week.